So we're now in the next chapter, and we're going to talk about fishes with how they relate to this class in particular in freshwater ecology. So the first one's about geographical determinants of fish assemblage diversity, then talk about physiological aspects influencing growth, survival, and reproduction. And this applies to other animals as well, um, even, even microbes, but uh, so some of it. Population dynamics and, and how we can regulate exploitation of fish stocks. Whether we should stock fish for fisheries and aquaculture. So some of these things we know already um, for uh, fish diversity. They're, they tend, fishes tend to be more diverse on large continents than small and more diverse in, um, in, in continents than islands, right? So the island biogeography. And we went through the whole thing about why, you know, more habitat and stuff. Why are they more diverse in old lakes and watersheds and what more diverse in tropics than the temperance? Mm -hmm. Especially if you didn't answer yet, you can answer now. You don't need to know your fishes. Yeah, more time to evolve, right? Um, more time to evolve in the tropics because there's no or little Winter season, right, exactly. Seasonal changing, then what else over, over evolutionary time? Just really not wipes out freshwater habitat. Creates a lot in, it, in the wake of it, but. Um, so, so what is in the temperate zone, particularly to the north of us, that just sort of reset all, all of the freshwater systems? Um, uh, you know, last time about 10,000, a little bit more than 10,000 years ago. Glaciers, good, Abigail, got it. Yeah, so any place that's glaciated, it could be the, you know, the high Andes, um, it could be, um, but it's, so there could be some temperate uh, tropical places, but and when there's a continental ice sheet, there's nowhere to go. Um, yeah, uh, they're also more diverse in, with more within habitat diversity, which makes perfect sense. Um, the fact is some place like the Kansas River is pretty neutral. Um, there's fairly many species of fishes there, um, but there's not a huge amount of ha uh, habitat diversity with the sand. I'm not sure that you all totally appreciate how many fish species there are in the tropics. Um, when I visited the Amazon, um, in the northern part of the Amazon basin, I was on a campus and there's a uh, poster of, uh, that an undergraduate student had done about the fishes that they found in the, on, in the small streams on campus. So there are like three small streams on campus and it wasn't you know, very big. They had hundreds of species that they pulled out of these three small streams. In addition to that, many of those species were not were unnamed. They just said, you know, species one of this genus or something like that, species two, species three. So this is, yeah, for those of you that are, that are biophilic fish people, um, the, 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 the amount of diversity in the tropics is insane. And this is part of the reason why I ended up here um, because I, um, I became an ecologist because I took, well, I love coral reefs, one, and, and, and snorkeling when I got a chance to as, as a youth. And then also I took a college trip to Costa Rica and, and uh, Panama and, and, and uh, Guatemala and saw the incredible tropical diversity there was and was very impressed. The last one is they're more diverse in larger rivers than small. So this could have uh, be because of more habitat. It could also be um, because of longer time. Um, small streams don't last as long over evolutionary time, right? Um, so that's another possibility. The Mississippi River drainage is, is a pretty old drainage. No. So here's uh, work that, um, that David Edds, who was at um, Emporia State University, did. And he sampled uh, in Nepal from the headwaters and uh, down to um, down to down to the large rivers and and went through the Himalayas to do so. It was pretty spectacular actually. But these headwater streams might maybe have one or two species. 
sort of like Kansa had water streams, and we got maybe three or four species in those springs way upstream. Um, but as we move into the Kansas River, we get quite a few more. Um, you can see that sometimes you don't find very many, but there's this kind of envelope that is going upwards. And this seems to happen everywhere around the world. Um, and I already asked this question. So here's Bill Matthews, um, just took a bunch of samples, uh, a bunch of uh, data published by people where they um, looked at temperate streams and tropical streams. And the tropical streams are in A and the temperate streams are in B. So we see here that for the most part, people that, were, that sample temperate streams maybe get 10 to 20 species. On a good day, they might get over 60 species, but there's only very few studies that have that. In contrast, <clears throat> if you go to a tropical stream, you could get very few species, but you know it's not that unusual to get 20 to 40, 60, 80, even 100 species in one sample, you know, in one fish sampling uh, event. So, so there's um, 204 is the total number of samples here, and 815 here. So there's a, it's a little bit larger sample size, but it's the shape of the curve that you're interested in, just to give you an idea of how much diversity there is in the tropics. We discussed why there might be more diversity in the tropics, um, time and glaciation. And the other thing is diversity begets diversity because um, organisms can be habitat in among, uh, among themselves. Where you are in the food chain depends, uh, controls how much diversity there is. So here's a relationship between the number of prey species and the number of piscivorous species. So these fishes are eating something other than other fishes. Um, these fishes are eating other fishes. And you almost always have um, more fish species in Eastern North America that are, that are um, being prey than they are being predators. That makes sense. You know, you, you can only support a little, so much of the big predator with the, with the, um, with the, with the herb, herbivore primary consumers. Just like you might see in the African savanna, see lots and lots of ungulate species and then, you know, a lion and a leopard or something like that. Okay, so there's some specifics on diversity in fishes. <clears throat> And now we can talk about the physiological aspects influencing growth, survival, and reproduction. So essentially any organism is, is, as we've talked about with evolution, it needs to work with energy and control growth, survival, and reproduction. Um, it, it, osmoregulation can also be a stressor for Andromeda species. <clears throat> but of the things we talked about, temperature, oxygen, food quantity, quality, predator avoidance, all important. So let's think about some sort of environmental gradient. This could be salinity, pH, temperature, where you have an optimal um, food, something like that. Um, and the first thing is to survive. So if you're outside of the range of temperature, right, the maximum or minimum temperature that an organism can survive in, um, you use 100% of your energy to stay alive. And if once you get to that point where you have to use 100% to stay alive, then you're not gonna make it if there's any more, any push further, because you don't have more than 100% of your energy. So first organisms want to survive. Um, and then though they, there's a narrower window in which they can grow. So you, you need so much energy to survive, but if it's stressful, you're not gonna be able to grow, right? And then we can, look at the last bit, um, reproduction takes even more energy. So you're only going to get reproduction in that sweet spot, right in the middle there of, the, of this environmental gradient. Okay. And this is all related to the energy because it takes more and more energy to do each, each step of these. You have to survive to grow, you have to grow to reproduce, and to reproduce you, you need to make eggs or something like that and take care of your offspring. Those are the kinds of things. <clears throat> 
So this is sort of what determines, um, you know, we've all seen things like a, a fish can be introduced somewhere, but it can't reproduce uh, and because it's just outside of its thermal habitat. That, that's one of the concerns about uh, global warming is that we're moving, allowing species, we're changing the envelope essentially, if you want to think of it that way. So here's uh, an interesting example of that. And this is not one that's uh, common here. We have to go a bit farther north. Um, and what we see is if we go to lakes that are cold, cool, or warm, and we have lakes that are oligotrophic, mesotrophic, or eutrophic on this axis. If we have a cold lake that's oligotrophic or mesotrophic, we can have salmonids. If we have a warmer lake that is eutrophic, we're going to shift to things like we see around here, well, walleye and perches not northern pike until we get further north. Um, if we have a very warm system and more eutrophic, we're going to get the catfish, basses, and bluegills. So, you know, Kansas is sort of in this region. The interesting thing, though, is that if you go to lakes that are potentially too warm for salmonids, but the they stratify and they have a cool hypolimnion, then you can put some on it in and have them survive the summer by being in the cool water there. So the question here is why is there not a thermal refuge for salmonids in eutrophic lakes? Yeah, so Tom got it. There's low oxygen in the hypolimnion when you have a eutrophic lake. So salmonids need oxygen to survive. Um, sometimes what they'll do to get around this is they'll actually oxygenate a little chunk of the hypolimnion. So it'll give, it, it'll sort of mix it in, but there'll be enough oxygen that the fishes can get in cool water but stay in oxygen. So they'll put in pumps or something to get air coming through just to make it allow them to survive through the winter. Okay, so this is a good example of how community structure is 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 stable by is is um, is driven by a by uh, uh, f other factors, and so the idea of eutrophication that we talked about um, repeatedly in this class then cascades to even the fishes that you might see in the system, and interacting with temperature, then we see this whole thing sliding further north with global climate change. Um, example of uh, predator for um, predator versus uh, food consumption. So here's another energetic uh, trade-off that we can think about. In this case, they had a tube effects, um, and they put them in these little cups. And tube effects is just you know fish food basically. Um, and then they had a predator that was was in the aquarium, but it would it would have a um, screen to hold it from coming in actually eating the prey fish so it was um, I believe it was a bass and a bluegill. When the predator was here uh, was there they took almost no tube effects uh, close to the predator and almost all their tube effects came from the feeding stations that were further away from the predator. When the predator was there not there they equally took from so that the tank was the same it's just the predator wasn't in there um yeah so th this is uh a, you know a trade-off and we what we have talked about the ecology of fear that um and this is a non-lethal effect of predation right and the, but a specific for for fishes And when we talk about population dynamics of fishes, there's this whole separate set of terminology that people use. And so it's probably good to review that. Many of you have had that already, but it's worth knowing. Um, 
so stock is what most people call just the population size. Um, uh, production is uh, population growth. We'll talk more about production when we get to the ecosystem um, in general. Recruitment is a number entering an age class. So the age class may or may not be arbitrary. It might be every year, um, and then it's pretty straightforward. For some of the fishes that reproduce more rapidly, um, you know, it's, it gets it gets muddier. But you you might say say it by size or something like that. This is important because there there are key crunch times in the survival of fish populations, and you want to figure out where the recruitment is the lowest, and if you can stimulate recruitment at that place. Oftentimes, that'll be in the winter time uh, where it's harsh and you're in low temperature and you can't quite make your energy survival. And there's a whole bunch of indices that the fisheries managers have come up with <clears throat> to quantify stock production, age structure, and recruitment. And they use these to build their management approaches. How many fishes can you take? How many we should stock? Um, those kinds of predictions. <clears throat> 